Number five, the Ring of Sylvianus. The Vine Ring, aka the Ring of Sylvianus, is a gold ring dating back to the 4th century AD. The ring was discovered in the fields of a farm in 1785 in Hampshire, England. Originally the property of a British Roman named Sylvianus, apparently it was stolen by a person named Sanicianus, upon which Sylvianus hexed the ring with a curse. That's right. In 1888, the owner of the property wrote about the ring in the history of his property, which is now a National Trust property. The ring went on display there in April 2013, where it's been ever since. Oddly, in 1929, during excavations of the site of the Roman Temple of Nodens at Lydney Park, archaeologist Sir Mortimer Wheeler discovered the now apparent curse that goes with said ring. Consulting shortly after with one J.R.R. Tolkien, Hmm, that's interesting. The ring is apparently much larger than most rings as well and was perhaps made to be worn over gloves. The band of the ring has 10 edges. Among it is the goddess Venus engraved, along with the saying, live in God. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. The lore goes while at the temple Sylvianus' gold ring vanished. Believing the thief to be an individual named Senecianus, Sylvianus demanded supernatural justice. And at the Temple of Nodens, crafted and carved a hexed tablet known as the Curse Tablet, or Defixio. On the tablet, he wrote, quote, For the god Nodens, Sylvianus has lost a ring and has donated one half of its worth to Nodens. Among those named Senecianus, permit no good health until it is returned to the Temple of Nodens. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that sounds like a spell to me. You better return that, buddy. Nodens is like Poseidon. Yeah, that's not good if he's out there looking for you. Number four, Tutankhamun's trumpets. The trumpets are a pair that were first found in the burial chamber of the 18th dynasty pharaoh, famously known as King Tut. One sterling silver and one bronze. They are considered to be the oldest operational trumpets in the world and the only known surviving examples from ancient Egypt. The trumpets were found in 1922 by Howard Carter during the excavation of Tutankhamun's tomb. Yeah, you know, the whole cursed tomb thing. The bronze trumpet was discovered in the tomb's antechamber in a large chest containing other military objects and walking sticks. The silver trumpet was found in the actual burial chamber. Both are engraved with decorative images of the gods. Similar looking trumpets feature in Egyptian wall paintings that are usually, but not always, but most associated with military and war. Silent for more than 3,000 years, the trumpets were played for a live audience of 150 million people through a BBC broadcast live in 1939. And then World War II happened. Because apparently the curator of the Tutankhamun collection at the Egyptian Museum says whenever someone blows into it, a war occurs. The same thing happened in 1967 and the 1991 Gulf War when a student was doing research on Tutankhamun's collection and gave her a whirl. Yeah. The bronze trumpet was one of the artifacts stolen from the Egyptian Museum in Cairo during the Egyptian looting riots in 2011 and then, hilariously enough, returned weeks later. Yeah, apparently it's like really cursed, like haunted cursed. Guy didn't want it anymore. Shocker. Number three, the purple sapphire. Well, not really a sapphire, but actually an amethyst. The spiky purple quartz looking thing. Hey, who said that haunted to hell items can't be precious and beautiful? Well, don't say that, because apparently this one is cursed, like cursed cursed. The mysterious Delhi purple sapphire is now permanently on display as part of the Natural History Museum's vault collection of precious gemstones. The mysterious stone is rumored to have been stolen by a British soldier from the Temple of Indra, the Hindu god of war and weather, in Kanpur, India, during the Indian Mutiny of 1857. It was brought to England by Colonel W. Ferris, whose family then supposedly suffered many financial and many health problems. I love how financials first. The stone was given to Edward Heron Allen, a scientist and writer in 1890, who claimed to have started having bad things happen to him and those who were lucky enough or unlucky enough to see or hold it. He came to the conclusion it was hexed with a curse and eventually decided to have it stored away in a bank vault inside seven locked boxes with a note of warning to anyone who dare handle it. Allen warned that the Delhi purple sapphire is cursed and is stained with blood and the dishonor of everyone who has ever owned it. Weary of its alleged powers, he kept it locked away in seven boxes and surrounded by good luck charms. He also left strict instructions not to remove the amethyst until 33 years after his death. It's very specific. Heron Allen's own daughter was forbidden under every circumstance to even touch or handle the stone, which, half a year after her father's death, she donated the amethyst to the Natural History Museum where it's on display today. 
Okay, so his own daughter donated this thing. She didn't even want it. That's a little spooky. Now, I mean, he was a writer, and writers can exaggerate sometimes, but not giving it to his own daughter and her not wanting it at all after his death? That sounds a little bizarre to me. Almost 2,000 stones were found during archaeological excavations in the Gamla Natural Reserve, of which the ancient Jewish city of Golan Heights used to sit. This is the site where the largest number of ballista stones from the early Roman period were found. Basically, these little sanded stones are perfectly smooth and perfectly designed for ancient machine gun slingshots. Oh yeah, and of course, by sling or hand. In 2020, a ballista ball in Israel was returned to the authorities 15 years after it was stolen. Apparently the balls were very cursed. Why was this particular ballista stone considered to be so cursed? Who knows? The artifact has been returned by an anonymous person under the name Mosh Manis. According to Mosh, the thief who stole the ballista stone stole it in 2005 when they were a teenager. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's uh, definitely not me. No, it's uh, a friend of mine. Yeah, uh, no, yeah. No, definitely not me. Him and his friends were touring a display of ballista stones at the Jerusalem Walls National Park in the city of David. These ballista stones were used by the Romans when they were fighting in Jerusalem in 70 AD as part of the first Jewish-Roman war known also as the Great Jewish Revolt. The man returned the 2,000-year-old Roman ballista balls from Gamla and actually wrote a little note on it saying, quote, These are two Roman ballista balls from Gamla from a residential quarter of the foot of the summit. I stole them in July 1995, and since then, they have brought me nothing but trouble. Please do not steal antiques. Uh, you said it, buddy. Those stones have seen their fair share of bloodshed. You don't want any part of that smoke. And coming in at number one, the Wailing Skull. Our number one spot, of course, the one that scares me the most. Skull banshees screaming throughout the middle of the night. Oh yeah, just screeching ghost heads. You know this is a thing, right? Like, way more common than we think. Like, they're like everywhere. Burton Agnes Hall is in East Yorkshire, was built in 1598 during the reign of Elizabeth I by three sisters of the Griffith family. The youngest sister, Anne, was apparently attacked. They beat her after she apparently refused to give them her belongings. Locals heard her cries and came to her rescue and returned her home, though sadly perishing five days later. On her deathbed, she requested that the head be placed within the walls of the unfinished manor. The family ignored her request, and after she was buried and the house's construction was complete, the sisters began to hear sinister noises throughout the empty house. Well, screams, actually. The sisters returned to their family's vault to fulfill the past sister's request, and when they opened the tomb, the body was completely intact, except for the now smiling skull across the room from the body. Okay, the head was taken back to the Bird and Agnes Hall and miraculously, the noises and disturbances stopped. It's like she asked to be there or something. The noises would only happen again when later residents tried to remove the skull from the premises. Yeah, I, I'd put that back immediately. Don't mess with people's scary shit like this, you know? The skull was later cemented in the walls for safety. Yeah, I'd hope so. Although the noises have stopped, Anne still makes a ghostly appearance, apparently, on the anniversary of her death. I don't know why people go around touching things, moving them around, like leave them where they layeth, you know? Number five, John Zaffis Museum. For someone like John Zaffis, opening a haunted museum was always in the cards. It was practically destiny. Few people can claim to come from a legacy of haunted museums, but Zaffis can, since he's the nephew of Ed and Lorraine Warren, America's most famous and oftentimes controversial demonologists. Growing up with a large fondness for his aunt and uncle's work, Zaphis developed a love of the paranormal from an early age and saw fit to try and carry on his relatives' work after their passing, opening his own collection of haunted relics the same way that the Warrens did. And what a collection of weird relics Zaphis has picked up. I'll shout out a couple of the cooler ones. The highlight for me has got to be this sword that was used to conjure black magic, and the sword is in like all of the promotional imagery, so it's gotta be pretty good. Check out this photo of Zaphis where he looks like a dark wizard who's also a fantasy author. Among the blade are things like a cast iron skull that was used in occult rituals, plenty of haunted dolls and idols, an ornate elk skull thought to be used in something evil, and loads more. Zaphis does point out on the website in the frequently asked questions section not to worry too much about being exposed to this stuff, as everything that's brought into the collection is blessed before taking residence. Although they do make a small warning on the website that there is a teeny tiny small chance that any residual evil might attach to you in the museum. So I don't know, make sure to wash your hands with hand sanitizer or holy water on the way out. I can't not include this by the way 
away. But the website also states that if Zaphis believes personally that any of the items in the museum have become too evil or too haunted to remain safe for public display, he throws it into an unspecified body of water. So if you're looking to start a collection of slightly used haunted relics on the cheap, I'd just check out the surrounding bodies of water to the museum. Now unfortunately, John Zavis's museum is currently closed. Hey, this list was about ones that had to be abandoned, right? Can't come as too much of a surprise. But for those who are hoping to get a good up close personal look at these cursed relics, Zaphis says he's been searching for a new location for the collection. Hopefully somewhere with some good ventilation, you know, really let all that evil air flow. And hey, if you're looking for more videos about haunted museums, haunted objects, haunted dolls, haunted everything really, we've got all more of that in spades. So stay subscribed to Top 5 Scary, keep the screams coming all night long. Let's keep going. Number 4. The Museum of Medieval Torture Instruments Pack up the whole family and make sure to stop by at the gift shop for the Museum of Medieval Torture Instruments. Don't worry, there's something for everybody here to enjoy. Make sure you take home the miniature guillotine. One quick look at their website is particularly illuminating. Our main product is emotion boldly proclaimed as their slogan. Yeah, well, agonizing pain is definitely an emotion, so I can't disagree there. The Museum of Medieval Torture Instruments really is exactly what it says on the tin. It's a massive collection of real historical relics and replicas serving to highlight some of the most disgustingly creative works of engineering ever invented. The kind of stuff that would make Jigsaw and his funny little puppet blush with anticipation. The museum's goal is to remind us just how truly unimaginably cruel human beings are are capable of being to each other and the lengths to which we will go to attain such horrid ambitions. The phrase, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it, comes up a whole lot on the museum's frequently asked questions page on the website, which is good. So come, learn a bit from such classics like the rack or the brazen bowl so you don't accidentally end up repeating those. I don't think I can even possibly describe what either of those horrifying things do without getting this channel permanently flagged. So if you're curious, maybe take the worst Google trip of your life or go up and and visit the Museum of Medieval Torture Instruments. They've got locations all over the states for your pleasure, and there's even one in Europe, but I'm pretty sure that's a different one. The one I'm talking about right now is the American one. The one in Chicago even offers a ghost hunting tour, as some guests believe there are residual spirits tied to some of the more grisly equipment kept in the dungeons. Guests are invited to spend the night on their own accord or with the safety of a tour guide to try and uncover any of the spirits that are said to be still living there, including an old executioner named Thomas who loves his work so much he just never left. Sheesh. Nearly a thousand years and he still doesn't take a day off. Some people just love to have their nose to the grindstone or to forcefully shove someone else's face into the grindstone to each their own. Number three, the Panang War Museum. I think it's a very good sign that your museum is a friendly, welcoming place. If you Google it and the first results are an article called The Horrors on Ghost Hill and a listing for an IMDB episode for a series called I Wouldn't Go There featuring your museum. It's either really hurting or really helping the tourism there. Well, if those warning signs weren't enough to deter you, enter the Panang War Museum, my little ghouls and goblins. It's been described as one of the most haunted spots in Asia flat out. The Panang Museum is built atop the grave of an old army fort built by the British in the 1930s, but was taken control by the Japanese in the late 30s in World War II and used to house prisoners for as long as long as the prisoners lived, which was um, usually not very long if the site of the guillotine is anything to go by. After the end of the Second World War, the place had become totally abandoned until it was retrofitted to become a museum and serve as a reminder of the grim reality of war and its costs. The whole place kind of has this eerie, abandoned ghost town vibe as you walk through tunnels and old bunkers, serving to try and replicate what it would be like to actually work and spend time in a place like this while it was functioning. Given the very grim nature of the content and the site itself, which was home to so much bloodshed, death, hatred, and all the worst parts of our souls, it's no surprise that the museum has an infamous reputation as a spot for paranormal activity. Guests have reported seeing strange sightings, unusual shadows, and feeling chills as they walk through the bunkers. But all of this begs the question, would ghosts even be scarier than the actual truth of this place? Now, I've never been, but from what I was looking at and gathering for this, it seems to me like the true horror of the Panang Museum is that it's a reflection of some of the worst parts of the human experience. A reminder of what happens during wartime and what people do to one another. This place doesn't need stories of spirits. It's haunted enough as is by the memories that will forever be tied to it. Number two, the Mutter Museum. Mutter is the German word for mother. That's your fact for today, so you can tell your Mutter that you learned something from this video. Well, this isn't a museum for moms or about moms, although they're more than 
welcome to come. The Mütter Museum in Philadelphia isn't quite like the other museums on this list. It's not particularly known for being paranormal or haunted, but rather it's a collection of medical oddities and curios all arranged behind cabinets in a very clean, professional manner. It's not known for vengeful spirits or anything walking the halls, but rather just home to an incredible amount of very creepy things in jars. Every picture of the place looks like something out of a mad scientist's lab, a background of a B-horror movie set, that one weird place from that one Harry Potter movie, maybe I'm remembering that wrong. Amputated limbs float in jars next to organs, fetuses from all sorts of animals you can imagine, and more bones than you could possibly shake a femur at. They got skulls of all kinds. They got skulls for days. They got an entire wall dedicated solely to the skulls of criminals, and all sorts of broken skulls and disarray eaten by tumors or other lovely diseases. If you're looking for skulls, they have got skulls. They've got a collection of famous remnants, Albert Einstein's brain if you want to see if some of that rubs off on you, Grover Cleveland's famous tumor, well we all love Grover Cleveland's tumor, pack the whole car up, let's go see that. You know. Fun stuff. Now, guests who visit the Mutu Museum do pretty frequently complain of feeling dizzy and uneasy while wandering through the collection. But whether or not that's because of some poltergeist or spiritual influence, or because you're wandering through a 6,000 square foot room looking at hundreds of brains, bones, and disembodied organs in jars, is up for some debate. I know just reading about this thing already makes me feel kind of squeamish, makes my stomach feel all churny. I wonder if they have a little cafe in this one like most museums have. You think anybody's eating there? And number one, the Museum of Death. The Museum of Death. Well, I wonder what sort of topics they enjoy covering at the Museum of Death. I bet they have an absolutely illuminating look at pre raphaelite art of the late 19th to early 20th centuries. They don't? What? No, at the Museum of Death, opened in Hollywood in 1995, which was opened by a married couple with the intention to make people happy to be alive. Whew. How do they accomplish this? Do they show you pictures of whiskers on kittens and raindrops on roses? No. No, of course not. It's a collection of everything to do with death. Bones, skulls, coffins, ancient mortician's tools, executioner's equipment, and a whole lot more. Amusingly, the owners have said their goal is not to scare anyone with this museum. That's not what their museum is about. Now sure, they play videos of autopsies and they have footage and imagery from incredibly grisly and stomach churning real life true crime cases like artifacts from Charles Manson's family or some of Jeffrey Dahmer's personal effects, but they don't want to scare you. The museum is there to show death in its brutal, unedited honesty. The owners themselves describe it as a commemoration of life. And I gotta be honest, I'm making it sound worse than it is, but it definitely does sound interesting. And the grimmest parts of me are definitely more than a little curious to check it out in that morbid sort of way, because it sounds cool. Probably a great date spot to take a goth girl, I bet. The museum does kind of embrace its sort of twisted reputation and really runs with it. It hosts Black Dahlia costumes contests where guests are judged on who's got the best post-mortem Black Dahlia costume, which is something. It's not thought to be as haunted as some of the other places on this list, but it does really bring out some visceral reactions in people. Apparently it's not too uncommon for guests to demand to leave early or to outright faint while walking through the museum. The owners refer to these cases as falling down ovations, which is a very funny turn of a phrase. Now sadly, if you're listening to all of this and you're already pre-buying tickets for your next trip to LA, sadly the museum is currently currently closed down. They are reopening though. They've also got a museum in New Orleans, since their collection of macabre knickknacks is so large it couldn't be contained to just one spot. When it reopens, I recommend you get out as soon as you can. It's a once in a lifetime experience. Eh? Starting off this countdown, we have Mary Todd Lincoln's dress. This beautiful dress was once owned by Mary Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's wife. It's a beautiful purple velvet dress with satin and lace detailing. She wore this dress during the Washington winter social season in 1861 to 62. But here's the thing. After her husband's death, Mary went into mourning for a long period of time. In fact, she stayed in widow's clothes up until her own death in 1882. So she had no use for this dress anymore. So she gave this dress and some of her other items to her family members. This dress was given to her cousin Elizabeth Todd Grimsley. In 1916, Grimsley's son sold the dress to the Smithsonian's First Lady's Collection. And now, apparently, it's haunted by Mary Todd herself. People have heard weeping when they have been near this dress. On a number of occasions, they have actually seen Mary Todd Lincoln's apparition by the dress. 
Thankfully, she means no harm. But if you think about it, it's quite sad. Even in the afterlife, she's still mourning over the loss of her husband. Hopefully, she can eventually find peace and reunite with him. Moving on to number four, we have the Smithsonian. One of the most haunted items in the Smithsonian is the museum itself. It is haunted by a number of ghosts. As a result, they actually offer ghost tours on location for people interested in the paranormal. On a number of occasions, workers have seen past Smithsonian scientists who would work on the collections there. But the most active ghost is that of the Smithsonian's first curator and second secretary, Spencer Fullerton Bard. Almost all of the night guards at the Smithsonian have seen his ghost wandering the halls. They see him gliding through the halls, people try to talk to him, and then he disappears into thin air. Then you have the ghost of Secretary Joseph Henry that also likes to show his face around town. According to the night guards, they said, and I quote, Henry is often seen fully clothed in the garments he wore in life, walking through the exhibits before returning to his post. His post being the statue the museum has in place for him. Dude, what in the night? of the museum is this? Seriously. Then you have the countless unidentified entities that also haunt the halls. These are just like black shadowy figures people have seen in passing. At least it seems like these ghosts mean no harm. Like sure it's kind of spooky, but at least they aren't malicious. Also hit that thumbs up button if you want to see me go ghost hunting at the Smithsonian. I'm down. I'm down. In our third spot today, we have the ancient Egyptian treasures. Rumor has it that a number of treasures or artifacts from ancient Egypt are cursed. I mean, you all know about King Tut's curse. Well, there are a couple of items in the Smithsonian from ancient Egypt that are definitely haunted. For starters, we have the scarab. This scarab is believed to be from King Tut's tomb. For starters, it is believed that bad luck will fall on anyone who handles King Tut's body or other artifacts in his tomb. Everything in there is believed to be cursed by King Tut himself. I'm sure you've heard of the story of Howard Carter and his team that excavated the tomb. After doing so, several of the people involved died suddenly and mysteriously. So it's believed that this scarab is cursed along with the other items there. And then we have the mummified cat head. Yeah, you heard me. Now this one actually isn't from King Tut's tomb, but a woman named Mab B. Nylon donated a cat's head. Yeah, just the head. Who knows where the body is? Hey, maybe she kept it for herself and it's on display in her house. I'm not gonna judge. Anyways, this creepy thing is a preserved mummified cat's head wrapped in linen. Inside contains a real cat skull. Well, according to a number of workers, they have seen a ghostly cat apparition move around this display. This damn ghost cat is probably out looking for the rest of its body. This cat has also been seen wandering the halls and in several other exhibits as well. Moving on at number two, we have the Black Aggie. This all started back in the 1800s when a woman named Marianne Hooper Adams, known by her friends as Clover, sunk into a terrible depression. As a result, she drank some of her photography developing chemicals and took her own life. After her death, her husband commissioned a sculptor to make a memorial statue of her. It was named the Adams Memorial and later Black Aggie. But because of how it looked, people called it grief. And that's when this creepy legend surrounding it was born. Legend goes that if you stare into her eyes long enough, they'll open up and start glowing red. Those that see her eyes will either be killed by her or she will cause you to go blind. Not only that, if you sit on the statue's lap at midnight, then you will die within two weeks. It's also said that pregnant ladies should never go near her. If they do, she will cause them to miscarry. Of course, this is just a creepy legend, right? Well, supposedly there's real life stories of this haunted statue taking people's lives. One man put a cigarette out on the statue's hand and he was later found dead with a gunshot wound to the head. Another man was found dead at the foot of the statue and no one knows his cause of death. Now you may be wondering how the statue got to the Smithsonian. Well because of the legend, a lot of people were breaking into the cemetery at night to visit it and it was often vandalized. So the family donated it to the museum where it remains to this day. And in our number one spot today, we have the Hope Diamond. This is a very beautiful diamond from India. But here's the thing, it was stolen from India and then a curse was placed on it. Back in 1792, the Hope Diamond was part of a Hindu statue. It was one of the idol's eyes. And then somebody went in and took the 115 carat diamond out. Upon discovering that the diamond was stolen, priests put a curse on it. 
The curse was said to affect anyone that put their greedy little paws on it. Which turned out to be a lot of people over the years. And guess what? Bad luck befell to every single one of its owners. It's said that the man who stole the diamond shortly came down with a raging fever and died shortly after. Legend continues on saying that his body was ravaged by wolves. Continuing on, King Louis XIV bought the stone and had it recut in 1673. He died of gangrene, and all his legitimate kids died early on in life. Then we have Marie Antoinette. Apparently, she wore it as well. And we all know how bad things ended for her. Another story involved an heiress named Evelyn Walsh McLean. She bought the Hope Diamond and everyone around her started to die mysteriously. First it was her mother-in-law, then her son, then her husband left her and later died in a mental hospital, and then her daughter. She later sold the diamond to get rid of this curse. That's not even half the people affected by this diamond, like the list goes on and on. Now the haunted diamond is on display at the Smithsonian. Hopefully no one will ever try to steal it because we don't need to relive its curse over again. Number 5 on this list is the British Museum. The British Museum has a super haunted item in it that is said to be somewhat responsible for the death of hundreds of individuals. The unlucky mummy. Museum Crush says not actually a mummy but the mummy board or coffin lid of an unknown high status woman from the 21st or 22nd dynasty. The British Museum's unlucky mummy has earned quite the reputation for causing destruction through its ancient curse. The mysterious mummy was found at Thebes in the late 1800s and tales of its curse start soon after that. It's said that of the four young Englishmen who bought it, two died in shooting incidents and two died in poverty. A string of illnesses, accidents, and deaths following this are said to be attributed to the mummy. One of the most astonishing rumors surrounding the mummy's curse is that it caused the sinking of the Titanic with the loss of more than 1,500 lives. One of the victims on the Titanic was journalist William Thomas Steed, who was one of the first to pen articles about the mummy's curse. Survivors from the disaster recall Steed telling stories of the ominous artifact over dinner, and as the mummy's sinister reputation grew, people even began to believe that its presence on on board caused the disaster. Now I will say this, there was no actual record of the mummy being on the Titanic. I mean think about it, if it was then how could it be in the museum right now? It would be at the bottom of the ocean. So we know that it was never actually there, but that didn't stop it from cursing the boat all the same. It's believed that Steed carried this curse onto the ship and that the telling of these stories are what ultimately cursed the ship to begin with. Almost as if bringing up the mummy multiple times in a row unleashed its power. For my sake, I really hope that this isn't the case though. Pretty sure I've talked about this mummy a few times before on this channel, and if this is like a Beetlejuice thing, like say it so many times and then it happens, then I could be in for some trouble. Number four on this list is the Royal Museum's Greenwich. So apparently the Queen's house in the museum actually has a cursed piece of architecture built into it. Museum Crush says, rather a large object, the tulip staircase of the Queen's House of Royal Museums Greenwich lays claim to being the first geometric self-supporting spiral stair in Britain and is rightly regarded as one of the great features of the former royal residence. But it is also the location of the Rev R. W. Hardy's famous ghost photograph. The retired Canadian vicar and his wife visited the house in 1966 and like many people before and since happily snapped away at the elegant spiral of stairs. But it wasn't until they returned to British Columbia and developed their films that they noticed a scarily cloaked spectral figure climbing the stairs. Subsequent investigations into both stairs and photograph have thrown no further light on the unearthly mystery, although as recently as 2002 a member of staff reported seeing a ghostly figure cross a balcony of the stairway before disappearing in time-honored ghostly fashion through a wall. I guess you could argue the staircase isn't necessarily an item, but 
Who cares? The museum is still as haunted as ever and maybe even more so. At least with other museums that have haunted or cursed items, the curse just pertains to that object. And usually if you don't touch the object or interact with it, you should be fine. Just walking around this place and especially going up or down the stairs carries a pretty heavy risk to it. Be very careful around the stairs at the Queen's house if you ever end up going. Number three on this list is the Thirsk Museum. Located in Yorkshire Museum, this tiny little quaint museum is the last place you would expect to see something haunted. Enter in the Busby Stoop chair. Museum Crush says, Yorkshire drunk, criminal, and coin counterfeiter Thomas Busby murdered his father-in-law and fellow counterfeiter Daniel Autie in 1702. Busby was arrested at the local inn and sentenced to death by hanging. According to legend, he laid a curse on his favorite chair at the inn, saying death would come soon to anyone who dared sit in his seat. After his execution, his remains were hung in a gibbet from a stoop at Sand Hutton Crossroads, now the location of the Busby Stoop Inn. The inn and surrounding area were said to be haunted by Busby's ghost, but one chair there in particular had developed a rather sinister reputation following a string of tragic accidents. Second World War airmen who sat in the chair were said to never return from their missions, and the chair also linked to several road accidents and fatal illnesses. In 1978, the inn's landlord removed the chair to Thirsk Museum just a few miles down the road. The chair is now suspended high above the ground of the museum to ensure that no unassuming soul can ever fall foul of its curse again. It's been hung there, unmoved, for 40 years. I've looked into this chair further, and for a while there, it really was that if you sat in this thing, you were going to die. It wasn't going to happen in a year from now or something like that either. Like, we're talking about pretty imminent death here. Number two on this list is the Natural History Museum. The Natural History Museum is one of the most complete museums in the world, and being so complete, it obviously has to include a cursed item. Museum Crush says, this apparently cursed gem was owned by 19th century polymath Edward Heron Allen. So powerful was its curse that he eventually decided to have it stored away in a bank vault inside seven locked boxes with a note of warning to anyone who dare handle it. Heron Allen also left strict instruction not to remove the amethyst until 33 years after his death. The curious story surrounding the stone says that it was stolen from the temple of the god Indra during the Indian mutiny by Colonel W. Ferris, an officer of the Bengal cavalry. After Ferris's health deteriorated and he died, the cursed amethyst was passed on to his son, who suffered a similar bout of bad luck and eventually gave it to Heron Allen. After facing a string of health and financial misfortunes, Heron Allen made several attempts to get rid of the stone, but they all proved unsuccessful each time it returned to him. Less than a year after his death, Heron Allen's daughter donated the amethyst to the Natural History Museum, where it is on display in the vault. And finally, number one on this list is Zach Baggins Haunted Museum. The number one voted haunted place in America has got to make this list, considering it's full of cursed objects. There isn't just one object here that's cursed, there are tons. In fact, we would need our own separate video dedicated solely to this place to even begin to break down all the scary stuff that's in this museum. Just listen to this small excerpt from the website. Among the hundreds of terrifying possessions, museum goers can even peek inside the VW death van in which Dr. Jack Kevorkian ended the suffering of terminally ill patients, as well as get a close-up look at the propofol chair from Michael Jack Jackson's death room. Perhaps most unsettling is the original staircase from the Indiana Demon House, notorious for its powerful paranormal activity before being demolished in 2014. The wooden banister and creaky steps from the house now stand in a dimly lit corner, resting on a blanket of dirt from the location. Following its installation, a group of construction workers walked off the job and refused to come back. These are just a couple of the so-called attractions that this place has to offer. If you go to this museum, then there is a very good chance you will end up walking out with a curse attached to you. That much paranormal energy all lumped into one place, it just spells out something haunted. Be very careful if you ever intend to go here. Coming in at number five is the Pitt Rivers Museum. 
This archaeological and anthropological collection is an offshoot of Oxford University in England. It's known for storing and displaying all sorts of items from the collection of General Pitt Rivers, including an extensive amount of historically significant photographs and sound recordings. That's not what we're discussing here, though. No. If we're discussing things that are creepy and potentially haunted, look no further than the Sansa's display. There's a room at Pitt Rivers dedicated to the shrunken heads recovered from the upper Amazon region between Peru and Ecuador. Lots of folks think that shrunken heads are just pulpy tropes used to mysticize people from the Amazon for use in movies and adventure novels, but they were indeed a real practice made by the Shuar and Achuar people. In order to capture the power of a person's soul, they would peel the skin and hair off a skull, soak it in hot water, and then have hot sand poured inside. As the demand for shrunken heads increased in Europe, more sloth and monkey heads were used. I guess there weren't enough human heads to keep up with colonial demand. The museum displays contain one human head from General Pitt Rivers, and nobody knows how he came into possession of it. Probably some sketchy business. Since then, a few more shrunken heads have been donated to the museum and they're kept in the treatment of dead enemies case along with other human heads. So if you've ever wanted to encounter a human soul stored in a shrunken head or maybe just some skulls separate from the rest of their body, head on down to Pit Rivers. But maybe don't look them in the eyes though. Coming in at number four, we've got Catacomb di Cappuccini. And if just the heads aren't enough for you, consider heading down to Italy to see a massive collection of mummified bodies. Back in the 16th century, the Capuchin Monastery ran out of space in its original cemetery, leading the monks to excavate crypts beneath. After mummifying a few friars, it became somewhat of a status symbol to be entombed in the catacombs, with many folks asking to be preserved in fancy clothes. In fact, for a long time, the catacombs were maintained through donations from relatives of the dead. Bodies would be displayed prominently as long as money was flowing, but if donations stopped, they would be moved to less easily viewed areas. Eventually, thousands of mummified bodies were put on display, organized by signifiers like class, gender, and profession. Nowadays, the catacombs are open to the general public, so anyone with an interest in preserved people can head out and see. Photography is strictly prohibited, and grills have been put up to prevent people from tampering from the deceased. But if folks were concerned enough to have their bodies dressed up and displayed, I would say they're more likely to stick around to make sure that it happened, right? In a tomb full of thousands of preserved bodies, there's gotta be a few ghosts circulating to make sure everything's the way they'd like it to be. Coming in at number three, we've got the Museum of Torture Instruments. Now, we just wrapped up talking about well-preserved bodies. Now, let's take a look at some mangled and destroyed ones. I know for sure that if I got tortured to death, I'd be coming back to make the life of whoever did it a living hell. Put me in an Iron Maiden? Guess what's playing at 4 a.m. full blast every night. Throw me in a rack? You'll be hearing my screams until you go deaf. Burn me alive? Good luck ever escaping the smell of incinerated flesh. I've got to imagine it would be the same for all sorts of folks. Dying in a terrible fashion does not make for a peaceful passing. So of course a museum full of the most malicious objects to ever grace the planet would be home to a few specters. Finding a home in Prague, the Museum of Torture Instruments has over 60 torture devices on display for the whole family to enjoy. From the flesh singeing gridiron to some stranger options like the Spanish tickle torture, you can treat your eyes to humanity's darkest hits. And it's not just the magnificent machines themselves, there are also wax figures of poor saps about to lose their lives to make it all the more real. Is that crying I hear? Coming in at number two, we've got the Museum of Death. Back in 1995, J.D. Healy and Katherine Schultz would write letters to serial killers. Often they would even get a note or two in response. Maybe even some artwork. Then they would put all these deadly dastards work on display. Eventually these exhibitions became so popular that it was decided that they would populate a whole museum. And so it went. In San Diego's purported oldest mortuary, the Museum of Death was opened. Over time, the museum has collected all sorts of different trinkets and oddities related to death and the people that cause it. Healy and Schultz even tried to acquire stuff from the Heaven's Gate cult suicides. The publicity resulted in them being evicted from their mortuary museum and moving to Los Angeles. The halls are full of fascinating and freaky things, ranging from baby coffins to the previously collected serial killer artwork to the purported guillotined head of a notorious French serial killer. Every year, they host a Black Dahlia lookalike contest with categories for both pre- and post-mortem. It's hard to imagine a place so obsessed with death not having a ghost or two to call their own, especially back when it was hosted in a mortuary. So if you ever find yourself looking at Jack Kevorkian's drip suicide machine and see something appear in the periphery, maybe back away slowly and try not to acknowledge it. And lastly, at number one, we've got John Zaffis's Museum of the Paranormal. John Zaffis is a second-generation paranormal researcher with over 40 years of experience. He's been all over the world looking for ghosts and demons and other unnatural phenomena. A prolific public presence, he 
he's starred in reality TV shows, made appearances in documentaries, and has been an expert guest on many a radio program. All of this knowledge about the world beyond our own has been put to good use in his very own museum. Many of the items he has collected over the years are held here. While some are simply curios from interesting places, Zaphis claims that a lot of the items held here are indeed haunted. He'll cleanse the items before putting them on display, although some are particularly active and must be kept in special cases. And if you've heard of Annabelle, you know exactly what that means. The museum showcases a sword used in satanic rituals, a military jacket that supposedly gave a girl vivid dreams of the battlefield, and even the Virgin Mary statue that the haunting in Connecticut was based on. It's kind of like Ed and Lorraine Warren's museum, but with a little less Hollywood scrutiny behind it. There's no billion dollar franchise backing Zaphis, just a few movies here and there. However, this makes me wonder what might go on here at night. If the ever prolific Warrens had trouble keeping the reins on Annabelle, you have to wonder what Zaphis is doing to keep his evil objects at bay. I gotta say, as much as I miss going to public places like museums and art galleries, I don't know if a haunted display would be my first destination upon getting my boot off. Just too many risks. Starting off this countdown, we have the Weeping Woman. The Weeping Woman, better known as La Llorona, is a terrifying part of Mexican lore. According to this legend, which varies depending on who's telling it, basically long ago there was a woman named Maria who married a rich man. The couple had two lovely children together, but at some point their marriage went downhill and he spent less and less time at home. And when he was home, he would only pay attention to one of his kids. Eventually, Maria found out that her husband was cheating on her. She was then overcome by grief and one version claims she drowned her two children, but then immediately regretted it. So she cried out, oh my children, or oh my sons. In another version, she drowned herself afterwards as well. So she is now banished to purgatory on earth until she finds her lost children. Legend goes on to say that she can be seen floating over bodies of water, crying or weeping as she searches for her lost children, which gave her the name The Weeping Woman. Others believe that she will kidnap and attack other children or cheating husbands. Both pretty terrifying scenarios, and tons of people are afraid of her. Now, the Smithsonian has this terrifying La Llorona doll. Currently though, it's no longer on display, and I wonder why. Apparently, it was freaking too many guests out. On top of that, staff have reported hearing sounds of weeping coming from the doll at night. Could it be that the weeping woman is real and has possessed this doll? I don't know, but I think it belongs to the Warrens Museum, not the Smithsonian. Like, I don't think they're trained on how to deal with spirits and other dark entities. In our fourth spot, Today we have the Creeping Doll, but honestly it should have been named the Creepy Doll because look at this thing. It belongs in a Stephen King horror film. So this doll was one of the first prototypes for a doll that crawls on its own. It was invented in 1871 by a man named George P. Clark. His goal was to make a doll that crawls exactly like how a baby does. And honestly, look how far we've come. Like those baby alive, but baby so real, like those dolls, scarily accurate. Anyways, so the doll's head, arms, and legs were made out of painted plaster. From there, they were hinged onto a brass clockwork body. The doll then moves forward by rolling along on two toothed wheels. But honestly, it just looks like a creepy robot baby. So not only is this doll terrifying looking, but then it slowly just creeps along. Watch out, this thing will haunt you in your sleep. And honestly, it doesn't surprise me that it's possibly haunted. Staff workers have seen this thing creeping forward on its own. Others have claimed to hear sounds of children laughing or crying near it. Just keep this thing far away from Annabelle, okay? Imagine the damage she could do with those bad boy wheels. Coming in at number three, we have the haunted painting. The Smithsonian is home to a number of beautiful, artistic, and haunted paintings. Take this painting for instance. It's called Memorial and was painted by Benton Spruance in 1951. Just by looking at it, it gives me the chills. The painting features a bunch of floating creepy heads or masks with a skull and cross in the background. For starters, why does that one eyeless lady look like the mom from Coraline? Like, I saw the painting and that's immediately what I thought. Unfortunately, not a lot is said about this art piece, but Benton was known for creating pretty dark pieces of work, this being one of them. And according to a number of visitors and staff members, they believe that this painting is haunted. For starters, guests have complained about feeling uneasy near the painting. Workers have experienced the exact same thing. They claim that the painting gives them the creeps. Not only that, but apparently there was also a cold spot around the painting, which was odd because there 
there was no vent or anything nearby. But around the painting, it felt as if someone was blowing cold air directly on the back of their neck and arms. Now, the painting was gifted by a man named John B. Turner, and it makes me wonder, why did he donate it? Did he know it was haunted? Did creepy things happen to him when he was around the painting and that's why he donated it? Who knows, but probably. But who knows. In our second spot, we have Abraham Lincoln's gold watch. That's right, Honest Abe's watch is on display at the Smithsonian. So this watch was purchased in the 1950s from George Chatterton, a jeweler in Springfield, Illinois. And it's a very beautiful pocket watch. In fact, Lincoln's watch is said to have one of the best grade movements in England and is still apparently in working order. On top of that, that 18 karat case is one of the best quality ones made in the US. What's also cool is that on the inside of the watch, there are inscriptions of people's names. Basically, watchmaker Jonathan Dillon got the watch and was repairing its timepiece. He decided to unscrew the dial and engrave, and I quote, April 13th, 1861, Fort Sumter was attacked by the rebels on the above date. J. Dillon. And he also engraved, thank God we have a government. Why? Because at that exact moment, he found out that the Confederate forces had fired on Fort Sumter, so he carved it in. And then in 1864, a second watchmaker, L. E. Gross, signed his name. And at another point, someone etched Jeff Davis inside. And Lincoln carried it around without a clue of the inscriptions inside of the watch. Incredible. The watch was actually given to the museum in 1958 by Lincoln Isham, the great grand son of Abraham Lincoln. And of course, rumor has it that Lincoln likes to haunt his watch. People have seen his ghostly apparition around the area where the watch is being kept. But damn, that must be one big apparition because Abe was tall as hell. So imagine seeing his ghost. Terrifying. And in our number one spot today, we have Abraham Lincoln's hat, another haunted object from Abe himself. But you heard me correctly, the Smithsonian has a top hat from the one and only Honest Abe. In fact, this is the hat that he was assassinated in. So yeah, no wonder it's haunted. Anyways, even though Abe was super tall, six foot four inches tall to be exact, and towered over most people, he decided to wear top hats anyway, cause you know, he's cool like that. This hat he got from J.Y. Davis, a Washington hat maker. In fact, he had the black silk band added to the hat, which represented mourning in remembrance of his son, Willie. Anyways, the last time he put this hat on his head was to go to Ford's theater in April of 1865. After he was shot, the War Department preserved his hat and everything else that was left at Ford's theater. Of course, they got permission from Mary Lincoln to do so. The department then gave the hat to the patent office and in 1867, it was given to the Smithsonian. But it was immediately put in the basement storage room. Why? Well, the secretary of the Smithsonian thought that there was too much excitement at the time, so the staff had to keep it all hush-hush and they didn't even reveal that they had the hat until 1893. Now, it's one of the museum's most treasured objects and of course, it has the history of being haunted by Abe himself. Apparently a number of people have seen Abe's apparition around the museum, mostly around the hat. But they have claimed to have seen a tall dark figure that looks like Abe in other areas as well. Want to know something kind of freaky but kind of cute? In part one of this video, I talked about Mary Lincoln's dress that's also at the Smithsonian. And apparently her dress is said to be haunted by Mary herself, meaning the two are together haunting the museum in the afterlife. Well, kind of sweet, right? Coming in at number five, we've got a mask of Hannah Crana. This item isn't necessarily intrinsically linked to the famous witch, but it is done up in her likeness and inspires folks to learn more about her magical ways. And that is impressive, so we'll talk about it. Way back when, in the far off land of New England, there once lived a woman known as Hannah Crana. She was an individual with a particularly short temper and a tendency to demand things of her neighbors with nothing offered in return. Come on, Hannah. Now, oftentimes her neighbors would say no to these demands, resulting in a bit of a tantrum from Miss Crana. These could be scary and upsetting, but nothing too terrible, or so they thought. Often, after refusing Hannah Crana a favor, these neighbors would have some misfortune befall them. And because of the rumors circulating, they didn't usually chalk this up to simple bad luck. No sir, they suspected witchcraft. The idea compounded over time, especially as things seemed to get worse around Hannah. Her husband wandered off into the night and perished after falling off a cliff. This put even heavier suspicion upon Hannah, who at this point was deemed a witch by all of her neighbors. And Hannah Crana embraced this title with aplomb. 
good for her, right? She took to walking around with her rooster, old Boreas, who many suspected to be her familiar. She cursed her baker neighbor to bake less tasty pies, and cursed a young fisherman to never catch a fish again. And eventually she foresaw her own death and made some more of her famous demands in relation to her burial. Her neighbors were told to carry her coffin to her grave by hand, not by cart. She also refused to be buried before sundown. Of course, when she kicked the bucket, they didn't want to deal with all this. But when they attempted to drag her coffin through the snow by sled, it would slide off and down the hill, forcing them to try again. And to top it all off, when they returned to Hannah Crana's home at the end of the ordeal, it had burned to the ground. A witch through and through. So be careful while looking at this mask. Who knows if somehow Hannah Crana could still be channeling power through it. Coming in number 4, we've got some satanic books. We've talked quite a bit about the allure and taboo that comes along with satanic rituals. When people find masks, dolls, tombstones, idols, and more associated with satanism, they tend to get pretty freaked out. They tell tales about what these objects may have been used for in the past, and generally attribute a whole lot of dark energy to them. Whether anyone doing this understands exactly what they're talking about is totally up in the air. It seems that every few decades or so there's a brand new satanic panic. X is leading to Y and it's going to corrupt our children. Why won't we think of the children? However, if folks took the time to attempt to understand what they were really talking about, I would bet that the panic might recede a little bit. The frantic reactions of the ill-informed will never stop, will they? On the many shelves of the Warren Occult Museum sit volumes and volumes of satanic books. These could be read by those afraid of what rituals might be impacting people around them. Or they could sit there and look scary. If you're afraid of something, it is likely that you just don't understand it. Demystifying ideas and people and creatures is often a good way to really get to the core of what makes them scary, and then you can see them for what they really are. People would probably claim that all these satanic books at the museum are haunted or cursed or have a history of being used in evil rituals, but would never themselves read one to find out exactly what the contents entail. Maybe that saves them from being haunted, but also it could cause them to live in ignorance longer, using fear as an excuse to make broad assumptions and statements. I know this isn't a fantastic analysis of the actual books found at the Warren Occult Museum, but I feel like when discussing things like this, it can be helpful to encourage curiosity over fear. Who knows? Maybe you'll learn something useful. Hopefully without having to resort to rituals and sacrifices. Coming in number 3, we've got demonic masks. Masks hold such rich meaning all across different cultures. The obscuring of one's face can cause so many things to happen, both good and bad. There's the classic idea that once a person puts on a mask, they will finally act as their true self. Others know that masks can protect folks from recognition, whether that means from other humans or paranormal entities that want to take something from you. On stage and in day-to-day -day performance, masks are associated with deception and hiding one's identity. So when they're used in dark rituals or other haunted rites, they may be inhabited by things other than people. Take a walk around the museum and you will find a treasure trove of creepy and disturbing face coverings. Uncanny valley inhabitants of the highest order, these creations of rubber and paint can really be upsetting to look at for too long. Red faced demons, dirty hags, strange screaming mouths and more. A lot of them remind me of classics from Halloween 3 and Goosebumps, two mask based experiences that shaped my childhood in ways we can't really get into today. Don't put any of them on for nobody knows what might be dwelling within. Could be a nice spirit or even better, nothing. Although there's always the risk of a malevolent demon waiting within, eagerly anticipating the moment an unsuspecting victim dons the mantle. Maybe stick to medical masks for now, no demons should be waiting in there, plus you'll keep all your droplets to yourself. Coming in number 2 we've got some glass eyeballs. They see you. In general, old school prosthetics fall under the uncanny valley classification. The folks making them didn't have the technology or experience to make them truly comfortable or convincing, so we often ended up with weird facsimiles of human body parts that are quite unsettling to look at. To be honest, I think the pirates had it right. Forget fake parts, let's just use peg legs and eye patches. Of course, that's not exactly the most dignified way to live one's life and not everyone wants to look like a pirate with a hook for a hand. So even before we had high quality prosthetics for general use, folks did their best to make replacement parts. And so we ended up with stuff like this. Two foggy glass eyeballs inside of what appears to be an Altoids tin ready to peer into your soul at a moment's notice. That's a grim image. And apparently, these eyeballs are haunted. I'm not entirely sure what that means, but it must be blood curdling. Maybe they float around at night, suspended in the air, implying a face that nobody can see. Or maybe a ghost without eyes pops them in from time to time, completing a face that went to the grave missing a couple of ocular grapes. No matter how you slice this, you've got a pair of roly poly disembodied eyeballs that cannot and will not blink. Things they must have seen. And finally, at number one, we've got a dark magic doll. 
Unsurprisingly, the Warrens had a massive collection of scary dolls. Annabelle and the Shadow Doll are just the beginning and are likely so well known compared to the others thanks to their relative power. These two will act on their own and often cause mischief and misfortune without being prompted. The Dark Magic Doll is a little different, where it's still imbued with a curse but has to be used by a human to take effect. According to Tony Spera, son in law of the Warrens, it operates kind of like a voodoo doll. By adding an image of the person you're attempting to harm to it, you can use it to cause plenty of pain in their life. Make the doll look like your target. Perform a quick ritual and maybe add some of their hair to the equation and you're set. Then you hang the doll and wait for it to take effect. Apparently those who are targeted by the effects of this magic doll will soon fall ill and eventually succumb to this illness. So don't be messing around with it for no reason. You've got to go in with intent and just for funsies, please let us know if that's something you plan on doing in the future. You know, just you know, so we know. We're not worried or anything, no way. Number five, the organ. Music is the basis of like every good horror movie, isn't it? Music playing from the other room by itself, yeah, that scares the shit out of me. When I forget my Bluetooth is on and I hear the music from the other room, my heart skips a beat. And there's some Shakespeare sonnets on there, you know? So it sounds like some dudes in the other room just talking to me in Old English. Well, there's actually an instrument that plays by itself, apparently, every night around 9 p.m. Unless it has priests bless it to keep it only wood and ivory. Apparently it likes to play a little number or two from the other side. Residing in the Warren's Occult Museum in Monroe, Connecticut, Ed Warren, the husband of the famous demonologist duo, apparently likes his classic music. Well, not live, I should say. He obtained the organ apparently after authorities cleaned out a haunted house owned by Reverend Eliakim Phelps in Stratford, Connecticut. Somebody from the authority at the city of Stratford reached out to Ed asking him if he'd be interested in obtaining a musical instrument in which needed some special handling. Nothing like a dusty old haunted organ. Like the old hockey games and churches organs, you know? Apparently one night Ed was woken up by the sounds of the chords of the organ being played. It was late at night, so naturally Ed thought maybe someone had broken in and was fiddling downstairs with the instrument. Ed went down to check it out, and as soon as he entered the museum where the Warren's haunted items are kept, the organ would just stop. Yeah, creepy. And also annoying. Like, why do ghosts always do that? It's so like trickster of them, you know? This would happen over and over and over again. The organ finally stayed quiet semi-permanently when after the Warrens asked a priest to bless the organ on a regular basis. Apparently it needed to be continuously cleansed or else the mysterious pianist would start their eerie tune again. Yeah, organs have to be the scariest instrument on this planet. So Halloween-y sounding, you know what I mean? And so Dracula-ish. Toccata and D minor, just Number four, the wedding dress. Your wedding day is supposed to be the happiest day of your life, isn't it? Dressed to the nines, till death do us part, cake smashed into your face, yada yada yada, and of course, that iconic wedding dress, you know? Yeah, it's tradition. So what's this wedding dress doing in the Warren's Occult Museum then? Well, the official story behind the white gown in the Occult Museum is that of the White Lady of Union Graveyard. She has been spotted for decades. Many claim they have seen the lady in white at Union Cemetery. She's said to walk the graveyard at night and locals tell us they've also seen her on nearby roads. Union Cemetery sits just off the junction of routes 59 and 136 in Easton, Connecticut. The legend goes, it's the home of a spiritual entity that allegedly walks the property. I can tell you that now for a fact that this place is haunted. It's one of the most haunted places around, said Lorraine Warren herself. Yeah, and she's seen some stuff in her time. One of the most infamous encounters is that late one night a man was driving down Stepney Road in his pickup truck just past Union Cemetery. Out of nowhere, a woman in a white dress appeared in the middle of the road. The man couldn't slow down in time and struck the woman head on. When the man screeched to the side of the road, there was no sight of the woman he had hit. Apparently this happens more often than you think on that road. Whoever she was, apparently the couple has her dress locked in the Museum of the Occult Finds and deems it spooky enough to leave it alone. Number three, the statue of Osiris. And speaking of ancient Egypt, we arrive yet again at something stolen. The statue of Osiris. In 1971, during an excavation in Saqqara, a Egyptologist Walter Brian Emery found a small statue of the Egyptian god of death, Osiris. He and his assistant returned to the dig site's office in a nearby village as Emery took the statue of Osiris with him. Once at his house, Emery went to the bathroom to shower, and after moments, his assistant began to hear Emery screaming. He found him clutching the sink, clearly experiencing some kind of trauma. His assistant said that Emery stood there paralyzed. I grabbed him by the shoulders and dragged him onto the couch. Then I ran for the telephone. Emery was diagnosed with paralysis of the right side of his body and was unable to speak. 
he actually died the following day. Talk about curse of the pharaohs. It's been said that there was a possession of a Canadian woman who believed her home had also become haunted by said statue. The woman gave it to the Ontario Museum, which returned it home to Egypt. Have we seen this video of said statue moving on its own? Like, this is from a Manchester museum, and this thing is just moving on its own all day. Yeah, this god's pretty powerful, and this stuff needs to be respected, you know? And returned. Like, you can't just steal stuff and throw it up in a museum overseas. Especially the stuff that clearly says in hieroglyphics, do not remove this, you will be cursed. We're uncovering more and more buried Egypt every day, just please be respectful and leave the stuff alone after discovering and documenting it. And whatever you do, don't play any more instruments, okay? Number two, ballista balls. Number two, the haunted book. Okay, so sometimes we all find spooky doodles from the past we drew as kids, finding old spooky pictures or letters written, that could be fun and great for scary stories. Apparently I drew aliens a lot, yeah, who'd have thought? This next item holds more than just letters though. It holds power. This haunted book was given to Brighton's very own haunted house, Preston Manor, after a Kent family who owned it claimed it caused them to be plagued by ghostly visitors and spectral visions. A haunted ledger which was found bricked up behind a shop wall has been acquired by the museum. Whew. The ledger was donated by Josephine Benyovitz. The book was discovered by her father, Tony Benyovitz, in 1988 when he was demolishing a shop which closed in 1984. Having taken it home, the father and daughter believed they suffered a number of spiritual visions and images of men, women, children, and apparently soldiers on horseback. The ledger, which dates from the First World War, was a clue at maybe who was visiting them. The daughter was told by one of the spirits that the book must be returned to Brighton where its first entry was written, which was in December 1915. The terrified family delivered it to Preston Manor, which is known for its paranormal occurrences and spiritual events. A medium visiting the house inspected the book and confirmed that they could sense evil omens emanating from its pages. It remains locked up only to be viewed after cleansed. Yeah, I don't think I'm going anywhere near this thing. Yeah, all those old books are usually wrapped in like someone's skin or something evil. Yeah. No thanks. And coming at the number one spot, the Iceman. This definitely had to be my number one spot. And it's not my favorite UFC fighter, Chuck Liddell. But this is the most terrifying find of all. Not really much of an item either, but more like a 5,000 year old frozen and perfectly preserved human mummy that was discovered in 1991 in the Otzel Apps in Italy. Otzi, of course, is the name researchers chose to name the mummy for obvious location reasons. This frozen mummy is of a man who believed to have lived 5,300 years ago. Otzi is believed to have been apparently murdered before being frozen in its time. This is claimed after the discovery of an arrowhead found embedded in his left shoulder and various other wounds on his body. He also has multiple different DNA types on his clothes, suggesting he was in combat or in danger in his last moments. The nature of his life and the circumstances of his death need more investigation, but scientists believe he's Europe's oldest natural known human mummy, offering a very shiny new view of the Copper Age. A huge glacier surrounded him after he died of exposure and preserved his body in a mile high ice cube. However, this is where it really gets spooky. Once unearthed, rumors of a curse surfaced too and grew stronger as people linked to him began to die often in accidents or natural health problems. All in all, so far seven deaths have been tied or loosely related to Aussie's dethawing, including forensic pathologist who was killed in a car accident en route to give a speech about Aussie the Iceman, a mountaineer who died in an avalanche, a hiker who discovered the Iceman on a hike with his wife and later perished after falling down a treacherous path, a molecular archaeologist was found dead in his home after he was finalizing a book about Aussie, the head of the forensic team died of a heart attack, another discoverer died of a brain tumor, and another researcher perished of multiple sclerosis. Yo, say what you will about curses if you believe them or not, when people start dropping all involved in this one find, there's got to be some sort of otherworldly connection going on here. Whatever the case may be, this find is one of the most scientifically precious and also one of the most spiritually terrifying. Should we study this mummy some more and unearth more mysteries of the past, or should we risk the lives of those who study it? Coming at number five, we've got the satanic idol. Now, Satan is usually quite a controversial figure. In the past, any mention of the name would have been associated with something terrible, especially as satanic panic swept the nation. Why won't anyone think of the children, right? 
Ah, uh, we love to assign weird moral values to stuff to ensure our political weight can be thrown around, but I'm getting off topic. These days, the jury is out on Satan. Many folks love the guy and worship him as ardently as anyone else would worship their deities. Some say he's a more forgiving figure than plenty of other gods and demigods. However, this idol doesn't seem to be associated with that end of the satanic spectrum. This one comes from the bowels of hell and brings with it misfortune and terror, or so they say. Let's take a look at this interesting oddity. With a misshapen, horned head, piercing blue eyes, and a strange, unnaturally slim body, this doesn't necessarily look like the powerful demon most folks would assume is Satan. Artists can take liberties with the things they create, so don't write it off simply based on its looks. Apparently, a young hunter had been scavenging through the woods in Connecticut when he stumbled upon this cursed idol. He didn't really know what to do with it, but he took it along just as well. Soon after coming into possession of this horned artifact, he ran into an old man in dark robes, one telling tales of doom and horror. This, of course, spooked the hunter who discussed this interaction with his friends. Eventually, after some sleepless nights and anxiety, he was put in contact with the Warrens who came by to evaluate the idol. They deemed it haunted indeed and took it off the poor guy's hands. I'm sure he was very glad to be free of it. Ed and Lorraine strapped the devil thing in and brought it back to their museum where it still remains. So if you ever get a hankering for some devil worship or really, really want to look into some Gollum-esque blue eyes, you know where to go. Just be careful. That cloaked man in the woods is said to have been a worshipper of Satan using the idol in dark and terrible rituals. I'm sure it's safe in the museum, but who knows. Coming in number four, we've got the toy monkey. What is it about old school toys that makes them so creepy? Like at some point in history, every single toy maker decided it was time to stop making them look that way and move on to much cuter, cuddlier, cooler, and overall less frightening things. Maybe tastes changed or folks just collectively woke up to the fact that they were letting their kids play with nightmare objects, but regardless of the reason, I'm glad we've left these designs in the past. Dredging up these figures makes for some good spooky times though, right? Take this toy monkey for example. Would you buy your kids something like this these days? I'd wager no, and for good reason. Not only is it unsettling to look at, plenty of similar monkeys have been featured in the spookiest of scenes across Hollywood, but there's a lot of dark energy imbued in this particular monkey. The one at the Warrens Museum is said to carry a terrible curse. Hell, it was even featured in Annabelle Comes Home. So what does a little monkey have to do to earn such a reputation. Well, this one seems to stalk people, torment them, and then kill them. Oh no. Imagine this thing suddenly appearing in your life one day, then as time went on it started popping up in places you know you didn't leave it. Little monkey symbols might be heard crashing in the middle of the night and disembodied shuffling can keep you from sleeping. All that's creepy, but it's still just a toy, right? Hold up. Did its eyes just glow? That is some monkey business I want no part of. But hey, at least this one in particular is locked away and not to be recirculated into the general population of antique monkey toys. Well. For now, anyway. Coming in at number three, we've got the haunted music box. Just another classic spooky object. Where would we be today without spring wound machines that generate tinkly renditions of famous tunes? I feel like every 10 movies or so, there's a shot of a haunted music box. Maybe that's a thing of the past at this point, but we do know that the Perron family dealt with a whole lot of nonsense stemming from a music box in the first Conjuring movie. Some things that appear in the Hollywood flicks don't actually exist in the real world, and they're just there to add some intrigue. The samurai suit in the Feely Mealy game were a couple examples of that, but we'll leave it at that for now. We'll focus back on the music box instead. After playing a big role in the exorcism of Bathsheba, it gained some wicked notoriety. Folks who had seen the movie assumed that this object was cursed in exactly the same way. That's not really the case, but it is fun to imagine, right? Music boxes are classic vessels for curses, especially thanks to the general creepy vibe the music can give off. How many cheap horror creations make use of a distorted music box song and some creepy childish laughter? Actually, keep the number to yourself. I already know it's way up there. Coming in number two, we've got the Pearls of Death. These are known for their outrageously dangerous powers. They might just look like a nice set of pearls waiting to be adorned by the fanciest of folk, but be warned, the glamour is not worth the price. And I'm not talking about how much you pay for them. No, it is not money that these pearls want, it is your life. Owners of this particular string of aquatic orbs have complained time and time again of the necklace constricting around their throat and choking them. According to the first woman to adorn herself with this luxurious item, she felt as if she was being strangled as 
soon as she put them on. She attempted to take them off, but was unsuccessful. Panicked, she rushed out to request help, and it took multiple people yanking on the string to finally set her free. Since then, people have been very reluctant to wear these pearls. Some believe that a Satanist or black magic worshipper cursed the necklace before it was given to the unfortunate woman. Kind of like the opposite of a holy person blessing an object. How fun. I wonder if we got a priest in there, whether they could cancel out the curse. I suppose not too many people are willing to test whether or not the pearls are still strangling. And finally, at number one, we've got Annabelle, the Warren Museum tenant who needs no introduction, the mistress of the glass case, the shadow clar of college boyfriends, the mega million movie star herself, Annabelle. What a classic curse doll. Honestly, I'm sure the museum could liquidate most of their other objects and still have a similar crowd come by if they just kept Annabelle. Legendary. She looks a little different in real life than in the movies, although I'm sure this is true of any movie star. We've already discussed her raggedy any appearance, especially compared to the more porcelain figure in the flicks. However, this doll makes up for a lack of spooky looks with a plethora of terrifying tales. After being gifted to a nursing student, Annabelle started acting strange. She'd move around the house on her own and leave little notes to the girls living there. Eventually, she would attack and strangle the boyfriend of one of the students, leaving them desperate for help. The Warrens soon arrived and whisked the doll away. However, they seemed to know just how wretched and terrible she could be, and as such, they locked Annabelle away in a holy box. This seems to keep her at bay, but who knows? Someday she could break free once again. I'm sure there are plenty more extra cursed and haunted objects held at the Warrens Occult Museum, but today we've only got time for five. Coming in at number five, we have Dr. Jack Kevorkian Death Fan, also known as the Death Mobile. <laughs> Dr. Jack Kevorkian's van was a place many people spent their last moments alive. The 1968 Volkswagen van was where Dr. Kevorkian carried out as many as 130 assisted suicides in the 90s, and it has become a piece of history. However, at the time, the pathologist was met with controversy and public criticism for his taboo work on physician assisted suicide with terminally ill patients. He spent eight years in prison for second degree murder because of this, but is often viewed as a pioneer in the medical field and as an activist. His impact was so great that HBO released a drama called You Don't Know Jack, in which Al Pacino won an Emmy and a Golden Globe for his portrayal of the controversial doctor. Over the year, the death van has seen many different owners. Zach purchased this van for $32,500 from American Jewelry and Loan. When the Detroit Pawn Shop first bought the vehicle, it was actually featured on an episode of a TV show. Apparently, Long Island medium Teresa Caputo also passed by the van in their warehouse and said she felt something there. Visitors of Zach's Haunted Museum can peek inside the Dr. Jack Kevorkian's death van and see the exact spot where many people died. Coming in at number four, we have Ed Gein's Cauldron. This is certainly one of the more gruesome relics on display at Zach Bagan's Haunted Museum, and it's believed to have belonged to the butcher of Plainfield, Ed Gein. He's known for not only committing two murders, but mutilating corpses and fashioning items from human skin. Some of this morbid creation include masks made from real human faces, a human skin lampshade, and a female skin suit. Although his kill count doesn't technically classify him as a serial killer, he still served as inspiration for several fictional serial killers, like Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Buffalo Bill from The Silence of the Lambs. This cauldron is said to have been a place for Ed Gein to boil body parts in, but its authenticity is largely unknown. It was auctioned off in 2015 by a man named Dan McIntyre. He claimed to have inherited it from his grandmother who bought it in 1958 at Gein's estate sale following his arrest. That's bleak as the highest bidder was Zach, purchasing the little pot for $2,800. At the time, Dan said he was happy to be rid of it, as it was the source of strange phenomena. I mean, I wouldn't want that in my home. Now, Ed Gein's Cauldron calls Zach's Haunted Museum home, where it is said to radiate negative energy. Coming in at number three, we have the Demon House Staircase. The original staircase from the Gary Demon House is said to be so haunted that construction crews walked off the job and refused to come back after its installation. Set back in a dimly lit corner, the wooden staircase rests on a layer of dirt extracted from the location famous for demonic activity. The Demon House was located in Gary, Indiana, and was unfortunately home to the Ammons family. It was said to be a portal to hell, and the demon seemed to emanate from beneath the stairs. The same stairs displayed at Zach's museum. There were reports of demonic possessions, a child levitating, and many other disturbing events. The family's matriarch, Latoya Ammons, had to undergo multiple exorcisms as a result. It was so bad that even the local police department and social services 
were convinced of its purported hauntedness. There are things in this world that we will never fully understand, like why Zack decided to buy the home plagued by demonic entities. He did shoot his documentary Demon House there, where he investigated the haunting. It must have left an impact on him because the house has since been demolished and the stairs continue to haunt Zack's museum. Coming in at number two, we have the Devil's Rocking Chair. This sinister chair is linked to a very famous investigation done by Ed and Lorraine Warren, and its story serves as the plot for The Conjuring The Devil Made Me Do It. Zack actually purchased this chair for $67,000 just hours before the death of Lorraine Warren. Ooh, creepy. The Devil's Rocking Chair was the site of the infamous exorcism of David Glatzel, who was allegedly possessed by a demon. The 11 year old at the time was being tormented by a man like demon who resembled a beast with sharp jagged teeth, horns and hoofs. As the haunting progressed, the chair was said to be under the demons power and David would often see the beast sitting in it. Ed and Lorraine performed numerous exorcisms on David in that very chair. The final exorcism was a success and the demon was expelled from David right into his sister's boyfriend who killed his landlord shortly after. After. He pled not guilty due to demonic possession, a first in American history, citing that the devil made me do it. It didn't work, by the way. In 2019, the Devil's Rocking Chairs exhibit actually had to be shut down because it was doing its job a little too well. Six different people shared the same disturbing experience with the chair. They all had bouts of uncontrollable crying, and one even collapsed above it. The museum having adverse effects on visitors isn't anything new, with ambulances having to be called in the past, but this was the first time in the museum history that an exhibit had to be shut down. And finally coming in at number one we have Dibbuk Box. In the number one spot is known as the most haunted object in the world, the notorious Dibbuk Box. According to Jewish mythology, a Dibbuk is a malevolent spirit that's said to haunt and possess the living, and the Dibbuk Box is home to the evil entity. This wine cabinet is so haunted that it actually served as inspiration for the horror film The Possession. The Dibbuk Box first became a sensation when it was listed on eBay, along with an extensive ghost story attached to it. After some owner hopping it came into Zack's possession. Shortly after the Dibbuk Box arrived in the museum, holes allegedly began to appear around the haunted cabinet. A downtown Las Vegas marketing executive also apparently witnessed a black cloaked apparition pass through the exhibit's door while doing a private tour with Zack. This haunted relic is no joke, even Post Malone was apparently cursed by the Dibbuk when he visited the museum with Zack himself. After touching Zack's shoulder, who was resting his hand on the box, Post Malone had a streak of terrible luck. In less than a month, his private jet was forced to make an emergency landing when two tires blew out. His house was broken into by armed robbers and then he got into a car crash. Coming in at number 5, we've got a vampire coffin. Say what? The resting place of an undead bloodsucker? In this museum? Well, what happened to the previous tenant? Was it forceful eviction or maybe a what we do in the shadows scenario where a vampire hunter snuck in through the basement and exposed an ancient vampire to sunlight? Regardless of how they came into possession of this burial box, the story probably isn't too pleasant. Still though, what a find. According to Ed and Lorraine, the coffin once belonged to a modern day vampire, but they didn't really elaborate too much on the details. That kind of vagueness just makes me want to know more, you know? Unfortunately, that story may have died with the famous couple, but we can definitely consider a whole plethora of options. There are all sorts of implications that come along with someone claiming to possess a vampire's coffin. How modern are we talking here? Were there other vampires in this one's undead community? Are they trying to blend in with the rest of society at this point, or is it a John Carpenter's vampires scenario where they're looking for more blood than ever. There haven't been too many sightings of vampires lately, at least by my count, so one has to wonder what's been going on. Twilight is trending again, so there's got to be some sort of vampiric element in the air. A couple more months till October and then we'll know for sure. I wonder if there's anything inside the Warren's coffin. I guess we can't really check at this point, but hey. If anyone has visited or seen someone open the coffin, would you be so kind as to drop the details down in the comments? I'd love to know if there are any rosaries, fangs, or vampire bones left behind. Maybe even some scorch marks that might suggest that the vampire did indeed get burned. Gosh, a modern vampire. I wonder if they like video games or watching sports on TV. Coming in number four, we've got cursed photographs. Cue the Nickelback jokes. Look at this photograph. Every time I see it, it makes me suffer. Not as catchy, but you get the point anyway. While none are particularly legendary, you can definitely assume that any photographs at the museum have a creepy backstory. I'm actually kind of surprised more cursed photos aren't circulating these days. It seems like a lot of photographs with spirits and curses imbued within are from the age of the dark room, or even before that. Do you think that tin type pictures were more likely to be cursed? 
I suppose there was the good old practice of death photos. Plus, plenty of folks got included in family photos, even post mortem, because the experience of having your picture taken was so rare. Folks have a lot more opportunities to snap pics of their friends and family these days, so images of corpses made up to be more alive are probably less common, at least as far as I know. The internet is a deep and dark place, and I'm sure there are folks who would pay top dollar for something like that taken with a mirrorless DSLR. Oh boy. Back to the museum though, there are entire walls covered in creepy old photographs. It kind of feels like a haunted house attraction at a theme park sometimes, now doesn't it? We've got brides with their faces totally obscured, white dress and all. Are those flowers symbolic or something? I guess we can't really know. Images of sinister looking men in hunting garb adorn the walls as well, making folks wonder what their story might be. Sullen faced children looking past the camera, images of demonic figures, questionably dark photographs of things difficult to make out the works. To look at these photos is one thing, but to have one in your home is something else entirely. Thankfully they're at the museum and not for sale. However, there is the good old theory that photos of the photos might bring the effects of the curse wherever they're viewed. So like the shadow doll, you might be done for just by looking at these pictures of pictures. Maybe consider investing in some holy water or seeking out the advice of a paranormal expert. Good luck with all that. Coming in number 3 we've got some samurai armor. I'll be honest right off the bat here. This armor, as creepy and cool as it is, doesn't actually exist. Like it's showcased briefly in the Conjuring Cinematic Universe, but we don't learn all that much about it. The reason for the lack of apparent backstory is simple, they made it up for the movie. Bit of a letdown, I know. But for it to have screen time, that must mean that there is a wicked tale to be told about this battle hardened human protector. It may have belonged to a famously brutal warrior, one who took the heads of all his victims on the battlefield. Their poor, unfortunate souls doomed to reside within the carapace until the end of time. Maybe the bloodthirsty soul of the samurai himself still resides in the armor. Perhaps the suit has a different story altogether, free from battlefield use. What do you think the story is behind this fictional item? Coming in at number two, we've got the Tombstones of Children. Yes, you heard that correctly. The Warrens had a collection of grave markers meant to sit above children who passed on. Now, in their defense, apparently these had been collected after they exercised some demons raised through satanic rituals. The tombstones were not originally moved by the Warrens, but by those who would perform these dark deeds. The Warrens simply took them to the museum after all was said and done, likely in an attempt to prevent others from using them in further rituals. Definitely a strange collection to have, all things considered. Is there something about a child's tombstone that makes it extra potent for ritual? use? I wonder what the rationale is behind that other than sounding extra taboo. And finally at number one we've got a haunted brick. On its own a brick doesn't seem so bad, it's just a bit of dried clay, that's all. But this brick is special. It was taken from Borley Rectory, also known as the most haunted building in England. This home, built for the rector of the Borley Parish, had gained quite a bit of notoriety before burning down and being demolished. After it was built, many claimed that it was haunted by a number of spirits. These claims multiplied when a paranormal investigator published an account of his visit in the Daily Mirror. From there, many more folks decided to see what all the hype was. People claimed to see little Victorian boys roaming the grounds, only to disappear without a trace. Cars have been assailed by phantom thumps, and ghost lights shine brightly in their mirrors. But why would a building built for a rector be haunted from day one? Well, there's an ancient rumor that Borley Rectory was built upon the same grounds that the Benedictine Mon monastery once stood. It was here that a monk and a nun partook in a forbidden relationship, eventually culminating in their untimely deaths. Since then, their presences have been felt all over the grounds, causing bells to ring without anyone around, recording equipment to malfunction, candlesticks to be thrown, and animals to be spooked. The rectory and the monastery are gone now, but the Warrens did procure a piece of the famously haunted place before it fell. One has to wonder how much haunted energy is still imbued in this brick. Would you be willing to pick it up? In at 5, Frederick Remington Museum. Located in Ogdensburg, New York, this museum was built in 1810 by David Parrish, before eventually being occupied by American painter Frederick Remington, who would later die in 1909, in the house. His home would later go on to house his most notable artworks, opening its doors in 1923, remaining open to this day. Now with a house that has seen a lot of death, it's not crazy to believe that it is housing many a spirit that is yet to pass on. Now, according to 
to museum director Laura Foster, the most prominent entity residing in the museum is that of Madame Emeriga Vespucci, a woman from the 19th century who was reputed to, I quote, to be one in a game of cards, aka killed. Now, in March of 2015, a psychic medium, Frida Gladel, conducted a walkthrough of the museum. She noted that although there was no full time spirits lingering within the bricks, she did in fact encounter a lot of residual energy within its walls, including that of a woman believed to be Vespucci, who informed the investigators that it was not cards that killed her, but instead a nasty owner of the neighbouring museum, according to the transcriptions of the walkthrough. Now, Laura Foster has been quoted in saying that a lot of these reports have been embellished and perhaps the ghostly talks of the museum are getting the better of it, but still, supernatural reports keep coming in. In at four, Merchant's House Museum. Now a museum, the Merchant's House was originally populated by the Treadwell family from 1835 to 1933, and who were rumoured to be haunting the old museum. Many visitors have reported seeing ghostly figures that match up the images of the Treadwell family. Gertrude, the youngest daughter, is most prominently seen roaming the halls. She passed away in 1933. Every year, paranormal investigators flock to the museum, including Dan Sturges, who documents the ghostly activity through recordings and pictures. Though no firm evidence has come out of the investigations, that does not stop the reports from rolling in. Communications manager at the museum, Emily Wright, has stated, the museum would never come out and definitively say, yes, we're haunted. Yet visitors have much reported sightings with images of the family. Very creepy. In at three, Torquay Museum. Now I just had to include this one on our list, not only because it's creepy as but also because it's in my neck of the woods, Devon, England. Torquay Museum was founded in 1844 and holds a dense collection of artifacts from across the globe. Now, there is no firm evidence or folk tales reported on the museum, but there have been two unexplainable occurrences over the last 10 years that even paranormal investigators can't seem to wrap their heads around. To begin, on the 19th of July 2015, an article was published on the Daily Mail website seemingly showing a woman in old fashioned clothing emerging from the floors of the museum. Take a look. Now, now, looking at it, you may just think it's a hazy picture of a girl in front of a fire. However, this picture was taken during one of the ghost hunting evenings at the museum, and according to multiple sources, nobody was in the room. Manager of the museum, Carl Smith, said, We saw something in the middle of the photo, and when we adjusted the contrast, we clearly saw the woman. It was a bit of a surprise and pretty creepy. From the angle of the photograph, it looks like she is submerged into the floor, almost like she is below floor level. Creepy stuff. However, this isn't the only unexplainable evidence to emerge out of the museum. A year later, CCTV footage captured this moment from the museum gift shop. Take a look. Now, papers flying off shelves isn't abnormal, but the rate and speed in which it happens certainly is. I'm calling Ghostly Farm Girl Spirit for sure. What do you guys think though? In at two, Smithsonian Institution Building. Opening its doors 10 years after our previous number is the Smithsonian Institution Building, and it is rumored to host many spirits within its museum, including founding donor James Smithson, whose remains have resided in the museum since 1904. Now, in 1973, Smithson was briefly disinterred after claims of his spirit wandering the halls of the museum at night began to surface. The coffin was opened and his skeleton was still in its rightful place, thank god. The reports still come in of his unsettled entity roaming the building. Smithson isn't the only spirit to supposedly be haunting the building either. Spencer Fullerton Baird is another sighting written about by the Washington Post. Baird was the museum's first ever curator and he is also rumoured to be walking around the halls with Mr. Smithson. Other sightings include explorer Emil Bessels, Secretary Joseph Henry, and paleontologist Fielding B. Meek, who died in one of the castle's towers with his cat. Have you been to the Smithsonian? If so, have you seen anything otherworldly roaming the halls? Crying for help, perhaps? Let us know. And finally, in at number one, the Cleveland Museum of Art. Not only a world famous art museum, but the museum located in Cleveland may now be the most notable for housing the spirit of Claude Monet, the infamous French impressionism painter. If you don't know, Monet had a distinctive look, a full salt and pepper beard, and would typically be pictured wearing bowler hats. So when reports started rolling in of staff spotting a man that resembled that description surveying the museum, people got interested. After a new installation arrived at the museum named Painting the 
Modern Garden, Monet to Métis, a staff member snapped this shot of a man that looks frighteningly similar to Monet, overlooking the new installation. Now, many have accused the museum of setting the picture up themselves in order to draw on the public, however, with the museum's history of ghostly residents, it seems unlikely. Former museum director William Mathewson Milliken has known to be spotted from time to time wandering around the museum, as well as the subject of the painting Portrait of Jean Gabriel de Thiel at the signing of the Treaty of Vienna by oil painter Jacques André Joseph Aved, they've also been noted to be spotted observing their own likeness in the picture. There are far too many reports to go on, otherwise we'll be here all day, but I highly suggest you look into the ghostly accounts from the Cleveland Museum of Art. Truly creepy. Coming in at number 5, we've got the organ. Thankfully it's not an internal organ or anything like that, although to be honest, I'm not so sure that would be any more creepy than this haunted musical instrument. Organs always tend to have a spooky sound to them, whether it's that classic bit from Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor, or some old hymnals echoing through an empty church. The pipes and keys combine to create spine chilling music more often than not. It's a classic sound used to elicit fear and atmosphere in all sorts of different environments. So of course the Warrens brought one back to the museum. It's not a grand affair, definitely not a pipe organ or anything close to one in size and scope. However, it does make up for a general lack of volume and dynamics with an array of haunted energy. The main thing that tends to set people off about this musical instrument is the fact that it likes to play itself. It's not a player piano, nor is there any sort of mechanism inside that would suggest that it was ever meant to make music without the help of a musician. But when the clock strikes 9pm, or the museum's apparent witching hour, this keyed instrument starts to play. I'm sure the first person to discover this detail was sufficiently spooked. Playing on its own isn't the only oddity associated with the organ. It's also known to cause anomalous things to happen to folks who play it. One might see a strange man standing beside the stool as they play, or maybe they'll have dreams full of haunting music for a while. If you go in and hit a few keys on this organ, maybe even sit down and play a fugue, all sorts of unfortunate events may be in your near future. After the organ was retrieved from the supposedly haunted house of a reverend, it was placed in the museum. Interestingly enough, no anomalous activity was reported before it was brought back. However, the Warrens were no slouches when it came to decorating, and soon enough the organ was covered in all sorts of other interesting oddities. Now, this idea I came up with on my own, so don't take it as a fact or ask me to cite anything. But what if the things the Warrens placed upon the organ caused it to become haunted? Maybe the curses dwelling inside of those objects came out and played the organ themselves. Food for thought, for sure. Coming in number 4 we've got human skulls. Speaking of objects that may or may not be cursed but also make for great decorations, the Warrens had quite the collection of human head tops. The pearly white bone matter that makes up the shield for our most important organ. That's right, plenty of human skulls in the museum. And not just for archaeological and medical purposes, these were skulls supposedly used in different satanic rituals. Oh boy. There is one in particular that stands out thanks to its interesting coloration and decorations. The eye sockets are painted bright pink and really pop, and some of the teeth are a yellowy gold, and there is a large star adorning most of the skull's forehead. It's placed on an ornate stand among a plethora of other spooky knickknacks. I guess I shouldn't really be comparing a human skull to a knickknack, but here we are. Now, like I said before, the human skulls accumulated by the Warrens were supposedly used in satanic rituals quite a few times. I can't really elaborate on exactly what that would look like, but the fact that they were there means that it's possible the skulls are now cursed. The demons contacted during said rituals could have left some sort of residual energy in and around the skulls, especially because they did originate from humans. Folks have been terrified of satanic rituals for ages, often using them as shorthand for scary, morally depraved activities. We might not be able to figure out exactly what happened with these skulls, but they definitely hold some sway over folks who might visit the museum. It's morbid, it's creepy, and it smacks of the paranormal. Just hope that this kind of thing never ends up happening to your skull. Or you know what, maybe you'd prefer that the top of your head ends up in a museum. That's one way to stick around for a while, right? Coming in number 3 we've got the shadow doll. Now we've all got a particular cursed doll in mind when it comes to the Warrens and now she's the star of a major motion picture franchise so it seems that she's always going to come in first. But there is another doll at the museum that should elicit at least the same amount of fear. That's right I'm talking about the shadow doll. This thing is downright but ugly. Like Annabelle as an OG Raggedy Annie is kind of creepy and they had to make sure they punched up the creepiness with some porcelain features and unnerving eyes for the movie. But if they made a movie featuring the shadow doll as is, I think they might actually have to make it less creepy. 
For real. I don't know if big movie theater chains would allow something like this on their screens. Feels like something out of a snuff film, maybe a low budget exploitation flick. Nobody's looking at this and saying, oh yeah, I want to watch a whole movie based on this thing. Worse yet, the Shadow Doll seems to carry a much more terrible curse than most. Plenty of cursed dolls require you to be in the same room as them in order for the worst of the effects to hit you. But the Shadow Doll just needs you to view a picture of it to generate risk. Just looking at it means there's a chance it'll visit you in your dreams and kill you there, Freddy Krueger style. And based on looks, I don't think it would make it fun like Freddy does. It would just be brutal and upsetting. Goodness gracious. Coming in number two, we've got the white dress. Another urban legend staple, white dresses tend to show up in ghost stories often. Murdered brides, young women gone too soon, mothers who outlive their children, the works. It's hard to pin down where the phenomenon started, but we do know that it's timeless and effective. So of course, there's a haunted white wedding dress at the Warren Occult Museum. I'd be disappointed if there wasn't. In the Conjuring franchise, this dress is said to compel any who wear it to kill their fiance. However, that's just more movie magic. There is no such tale actually associated with the museum. However, they do display a bridal gown, veil and all, and there is a supposed story that goes along with it. It's meant to represent the White Lady of Union Graveyard in Connecticut, a classic urban legend that we've definitely touched on here before. It's the tale of an unfortunate soul who roams the roads at night, causing accidents and freaking out motorists. Apparently one time she even materialized and put a dent in someone's fender. Unfortunately, the white dress in the museum isn't actually from the white lady or anything related to her. It's just meant to represent the legend, add a little bit of class to the joint. Because who doesn't love looking at a pretty white dress? And finally, at number one, we've got the conjuring mirror. To cap things off, we'll talk about a particularly spooky reflective surface, the conjuring mirror. No relation to the actual conjuring films though, so far anyway. This is one that has a truly terrifying story attached to it. The idea of mirrors as portals to other worlds is well documented, with different cultures around the world coming to similar conclusions about these shiny planes. People often see things they wish they hadn't in a mirror, which is especially true of the one at the Warren Occult Museum. It's said that if you look into it for long enough, you'll start to see conjured spirits. In fact, the mirror apparently does its best to conjure these spirits upon the user. The story goes that Ed and Lorraine came into possession of it after its previous owner stared into the mirror for weeks on end. For a while, nothing happened, but eventually it conjured up a series of faces and figures so gruesome and horrifying the man lost his mind entirely. He was sent to a mental institution and the mirror was sent to the Warrens. Since then, people have looked into the mirror, but definitely not for weeks at a time. I wonder what would happen if someone replicated the experiment. Well then, hopefully these fascinating relics find a new home where they can be visited by interesting parties. Whether that means a brand new location for the Warrens Museum or maybe distribution to other haunted depositories. I just hope this stuff doesn't get sent out into the world willy nilly. That could end poorly. So what'd you think of the list? Do you agree with my picks? Which item freaks you out the most? Make sure you let me know down in the comments. Speaking of comments, let's take a look at some of your more tantalizing ones from the top 5 scary angels in horror movies part 2. The Stranger Sound says, thought I recognized some faces. I am legitimately friends with half of the cast for Angel, no joke. So happy to see them here. Hey, always wicked to see your friends doing it big, eh? Tony Kalikiki says, how about Christopher Walken's Gabriel? Make sure you check out part 1, huh? Prep for it says, I totally agree with you regarding Tilda Swinton. She was oddly creepy as Sal, the leader of a hippie commune in the movie The Beach, a very underrated actor. She just fits so well with like literally any role. Joanna Andrews says, love these videos about angels that are scary. Glad you're enjoying them. And to cap it off, we've got a couple Dogma fans commenting one after another. You two should be friends. And that's all the time we have for today. I'm going to open the hatch of a submarine while at the bottom of the ocean. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.